Welcome to CO2K Online. My name is Henry Nell and I serve as the youth pastor here at Church of the King. Today, I want to invite you to get connected. If it's your first, second, tenth or hundredth time that you are watching CO2K, I want to invite you to get connected in the spiritual family. You can do that by filling out the connect card on our website or using the link down in the description box below. Today, I would also like to say thank you so much for your generosity, throwing your money into God's kingdom and trusting Him and see what He can do globally and locally. Today, you can give by texting the number available on the screen. You can also use our website or our app. Enjoy today's word. Well, hey, good morning and welcome to COTK Online. I am Josh, I'm one of the pastors here. I just want to say welcome. It is great to have you with us today as we kick off Uh, our summer series going through the book of Joshua. I love this book and I'm excited about the series, not just because it's uh, the name that I get my name from, Joshua, um, but it is just such an amazing book filled with some really incredible stories uh, of what God did in and through the Israelites and how that applies to us today. So I hope you you buckle up, you get ready. We're going to have a lot of fun. Um, so I want you to do, if you got your Bibles or your apps, grab them. We're going to be in Joshua 1 uh, pretty much most of today. If we look at, if we have a theme verse, I guess, if we were to pick out a theme verse for the book of Joshua, I think Joshua 1, 9, you could see a couple of the versions of it as well. But I think Joshua 1, 9 would be what I would say is the verse of the book of Joshua. And this is what, this is the Lord talking to Joshua. And he says this, this is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I love that verse. Here's the thing, if you get nothing else out of today, you need to know that if you are following the Lord, he is with you. And because the God of of everything, the God of, of all things is with you, you know that you can be strong and courageous. One of my favorite, I guess, stories came from an actor um, that I know, but he gave me a really good quote. He gave us a really good quote. Uh, The quote was this, courage is being afraid and saddling up anyway. And it was a Western actor. But the way we get to that quote um, starts all the way back in 1930. So there's a guy named Marion Morrison. I don't know if you've ever heard the name. Some of you might recognize it. But Marion Morrison, uh, he was from Iowa, and they had moved to California's family had just because of how bad things were um, with the droughts that took place in the 20s. And so they were in California in 1930 when on set, he was helping move some furniture on set in California when director Raul Walsh noticed him and offered him a job in an upcoming Western called The Big Trail. This is back in 1930. These things were pretty much silent Westerns and they had like all sorts of stuff. Now, if this seems like the start of some cool Hollywood story, um, sure, cool. But for Marion, this had been anything but great, even already up to 1930. Okay, so he was born in 1911. They moved to California because of his dad's health and how bad everything was there in Iowa. But life was really rough for these guys. It was rough. The economy was terrible. This is Great Depression time frame. You look at all these different things. I mean, shoot, when you read through some of their stories, hot dogs, like hot dogs were a luxury for these guys when they could afford them. Think about that. Going down and picking up hot dogs is a luxury uh, for this family, but that's what it was for them. They were not poor, um, but Mary made the best of it, and he got into high school. Um, he was president of the Latin Society, member of the debate team, president of the 1924 championship, or the player of the 1924 championship football team for his high school. Um, they did really good. Um, the University of Southern California, you start thinking about how things are looking up for this guy, offered him a football scholarship, and everything is finally going awesome for him until he gets injured and it ends his scholarship. Done. Everything's gone. And so he's out of college, is injured. He can't do the thing he was good at, the thing that was opening up doors for him. And again, this is against the backdrop of the Great Depression, okay? And so, or coming into the Great Depression. And so things all of a sudden go from bad to really, really bad. And so he finally gets um, from, a, it was a favor of a friend that opened up a door for him to begin working in the studios around Hollywood, just helping out. Even after, though, his first big break in 1930, even after he had that, um, that awesome kind of opening and got to play in this role, and I've seen the movie, actually, which is kind of funny, he would struggle for years to make a living, just to even just to get in and do it. Even if he's already been an actor once, just to try to make that would happen, it, would just, it didn't happen. And so finally, in 1939, would be his breakout moment, and it would be in a movie called Stagecoach. In the 1940s, his career took off, and he became a household name. And some of you, if you're old enough or if you have parents who are really cool, will recognize his name a little bit. It's not just Mary, and he changed it. Um, but he still has some major challenges ahead. He would have lung ca- cancer. Uh, he would have lose two ribs and a lung to that cancer as well. And then ultimately, in 1979, 
he would die of cancer. Here's the thing about this guy, though, that I love so much. What made him iconic, what made him so awesome was that he would play characters who would face these insurmountable odds. They were, everything was stacked up against them, these impossible situations. But they still went out. His character would always still go out and fight the battle that needed to be fought, save who needed to be saved. That was his character. And so when you look at that era and that time frame, people were watching these movies and, and they were seeing this guy and going, man, okay, he's facing through all these different things. And so we looked oftentimes to movie characters as, as I don't know, inspiration for how we do. And that's how he... That's how he did his life. That's how he did his, his movies. And here's and the quote I said earlier was, courage is having, is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. And the actor's name is John Wayne. And I'm a huge John Wayne fan. So if you haven't watched any John Wayne movies, if you have no clue who John Wayne is because you're under 20 years old, it's okay. Uh, go watch a movie tonight. Uh, I love, let's see, what would be a good John Wayne movie? Ooh, um, so many options. El Dorado's great. The Sons of Katie Elder. Big Jake. I don't know. Go, go find one. They're great. So anyway, courage. We're talking about courage today. Here, if I'm going to sum up courage in one simple thing, it is this. Courage is making the choice to do the hard things. Courage is making the choice to do the hard things. You could even say the things that scare us. So when we look at the book of Joshua, when we get into the very first part of Joshua, we see the Lord having this conversation with Joshua. Now, Joshua was Moses' protege, okay? So he was the one that Moses had had raised up. Joshua had been born in Egypt. He was one of two guys, Caleb and Joshua, the only two that we know of that were uh, that were part of the original fighting men age that were allowed to go in the promised land because they were the ones that believed God when God said, hey, you can have this promised land. So 40 years before this letter, before we get to the book of Joshua, the Israelites are on the steps of the promised land, getting ready to go in. They send 12 spies in. And Joshua and Caleb come back and go, man, this place is awesome. We can do it. Let's go and kick butt. Ten other guys are like, oh, this place is awesome, but we're going to die. And so they did not have, these 10 men did not have the same courage that Joshua and Caleb did. And so they convinced an entire nation to rebel against God and not go into the promised land. And so God said, okay, that's how you're going to do it. 40 years, you're going to wander this desert to all of you guys that didn't have that faith till you're gone. He said, Joshua and Caleb, they'll remain. And they did, which is cool. So here we are on the edge of the promised land. Joshua's been through it all. He's, he was there when Moses got the Ten Commandments. Uh, he was waiting down on the mountain. And you can see that in Exodus 32. When Israel was attacked, it was Joshua who led them into battle. This is when they were just fresh coming out of Egypt and had no clue. Joshua was the one that did that. And then here we are. Moses dies. Moses is, as God said, okay, Moses, it's your time to pass away. Joshua, you're the one. And I have to think, you look at, at everything that Joshua has done. He's not a guy who is scared, but yet you look at the conversation that God's having with him, and I have to wonder if there's still some things in Joshua that are a little bit fearful. So look, let's look, Joshua 1, 9. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. And he said this, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I'm giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Whatever you set foot... Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land that I've given to you from the Negev wilderness in the south, the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. That sounds really cool. But then look what he says to Joshua next. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to the ancestors that I would give to them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to follow all the instructions that Moses gave you. Don't deviate from them, turning to either the left or to the right. You'll be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey everything written on it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. He says it again. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I want to tell you something. You need courage. All right, this is not just God talking to Joshua. This is God talking to you. You need courage. You may not be in the steps of Joshua where you're leading a nation into the promise that God had given them. But I will tell you this, you will need courage for this life. And that's, that's kind of like, duh. Like if you're sitting there going, okay, duh. Yeah, I need courage. Or you may not have even thought about that, but you need courage to live this life. You need courage to live holy in an unholy world. We're living in a time where so much of, of what our, our world and our culture celebrates is so far away from what God has intended for the way for us to live. So you need courage to live holy in this unholy world. You need courage to do the right thing when the wrong thing is easy. Come on, somebody. 
That can be everything from from cheating on a test to to fudging some numbers at work. You need courage to do the right thing when the wrong thing is easy. You need courage to be a parent. You need courage to be a spouse. You need courage to be single. You need courage at school. You need courage on the job. You need courage in your home. You need courage to face the past. You need courage to face the future. You need some courage. I hope I'm, I'm getting through, but you need courage. So how do we get courage? We're going to look at this. And we're going to go back to Joshua. And here's some things. First of all, to gain courage, we got to recognize four things. The first thing is this. Number one, and this may seem really, really crazy to you if you've never like thought about this before this way. Courage is a choice. Courage is a choice. We don't often think of that as being something that's a choice. We think, well, I am courageous or I'm not courageous. But courage is a choice. You choose to be courageous and you even choose to be strong. How many times have you heard someone, or maybe Eve, you've even said, I would just love to do, fill in the blank. I'd love to um, get my pilot's license. I'd love to um, get a, go back to college. But I'm just not brave enough. I'm just not strong enough. I just don't have enough to do it. These are all things that we, we pilot. But here's the thing. That's only true. That statement is only true because you're choosing it. That statement is only, I mean, obviously I recognize there are some physical limitations in terms of money sometimes and things like that. But shoot, sometimes we just have to have the courage to, to approach something differently to accomplish the things that God has placed in our heart. Courage is a choice. And how do we know this? Because you look at what God is telling to Joshua. I want you to listen to the words he's using. He doesn't say, Joshua, I'm going to make you strong. Did you catch that? Go back and look at those verses, verse six, verse seven, verse nine. He doesn't say, Joshua, I'm going to make you strong. He tells him, he commands him. He says, hey man, I need you to be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. This is my command. Listen to what he's telling him. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. And then he tells him, don't be afraid or discouraged. We think of these things as sometimes just things that are happening around us and we are afraid or we are courageous. But God is telling Joshua, no, 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 no. This is my command. I need you to choose to be courageous. I need you to choose to be strong. I need you to choose to not fear and to not be discouraged. He's commanding Joshua to make this choice. Of, are you going to be this way or are you going to be that way? Courage is a choice. The second thing that I see in this, and this is in verse six, is that courage comes with our calling. He says, be strong and courageous. But then he says this, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess the land, all the land that I swore to their ancestors I would give to them. Here's the thing. With your calling, and I'm going to go into what that looks like in just a second, but with your calling comes both, your calling is going to require courage from you because you think about what it took for Joshua to lead these people. That required courage. Your calling is going to both require courage from you, but it will also provide courage. When you know what God has called you to do, when you know what God has called you to do, when you know what your purpose is, it fills you with courage because you know this is what God has created me to do, created me to be. You know, you look at some different things we could, you know, husband, wife, coach, man, parent is a, is a great one. I don't know about you, but we had five kids and it takes courage to change a diaper sometimes because you can smell that thing coming from a mile. I'm being a little bit joking, but, but it takes courage to be a parent. It takes courage to have those hard conversations with our kids. It takes courage to say no. It takes courage to, to, push our children to grow, to develop in areas that we know that it takes courage to back off. It takes courage to know that when it's our ego that's getting in the way of what our kids, who they really are and who God's made them, it takes courage to embrace how God has created our children and made them and what he's made them to be. Parenting is an easy one. Coach, teacher, plant operator, it takes courage to do the right thing sometimes when you're in these plants. Electrician, lawyer, how about this one? Being a friend to a difficult person, that can require courage sometimes. These are all callings. These are all purposes. It takes courage to do that. But when you know what God has called you to do, when you know that, hey, this is what, this is what God has, has placed in my heart to do, it fills you with courage because you know that God made you for that moment. When, you're, when you are in, a, in, your, in your marriage with your spouse and you're facing different things, it's God who puts you two together. You may sit back and go, man, I don't know if I ever. No, like you two are together. Like God has created you for, for that marriage and that relationship. So it takes courage sometimes to walk that out. As a parent, it, God has created you and made you and purposed you to be the parent to the children that you have. It takes courage in our blended families to be the step-parent 
to the children that we are now entrusted with. God has entrusted you. That's part of your purpose. And so it requires courage, but it also provides courage because, man, I want you to know God's placed you there for a purpose and a reason. In your job, in your roles, you are there for a reason and a purpose. So it provides courage. And you've got to know that God is with you through it all, even when it doesn't look great. All right, so courage is a choice. It comes from our calling. Here's the third thing it comes from. It comes from our commitment. I want you to catch this because this one's huge. Verse seven and eight, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. What's he talking about? He's talking about the law, the first five books of the Bible. This is what God had had laid out through Moses and, and shown Moses his ways of doing things. He says this, don't deviate from them, turning to either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey everything in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. There is a concept um, called habit stacking. And here's the thing. When you, when you look at, at our lives, when things are going well in your life, it helps everything else go well. All right, so if you're, if you're let's see, if you, if you are doing well in your exercise program, all right, you start to see some results there or the way you're, you're managing your diet, it, it gives you confidence and you start doing well things in other places. You start doing things well in other places. Why? Because you've had successes here. So if you're having successes here, it helps you build on those successes for what's coming next. When your budget is doing well and you've got that under control and you're going, man, I'm, I'm, I'm tithing, I'm saving, I'm, I'm living within my means. It gives you confidence to face other challenges. Why? Because winning, nothing helps winning like winning. Nothing helps you build into the next thing like doing well where you're right with what's right in front of you. And so when God's talking to Joshua, he is going, hey, look, I need you to develop the habit of knowing me, of knowing my word, of, of knowing these things. Why? Because when you do that, when you start to win here, it's going to help you. In fact, he even tells him that. He goes, hey, look, if you do this, only then you're going to prosper and succeed in all you're doing. He's going, hey, Joshua, if you will get this part right, if you start winning here and this and knowing me and walking with me, then it's going to help you here. James Clear in his book called Atomic Habits, if you haven't read it yet, it's a, it's a cool book to read. Um, it's one I'm still trying to get straightened out in my life. In all honesty, I'm still learning this. But he teaches this concept of habit stacking. He's not the only person. There's a couple other uh, authors that, have, that have, have taught this. But the idea is this, when you take one habit and you develop that one habit, for some of us in the morning, coffee is our habit. All right. So we get up in the morning, we start to make that pot of coffee or you put your Keurig on or whatever, your espresso machine, if you're really cool, not like me. And you sit down and you start drinking your pot of coffee. That's a habit. And so we've developed a habit. So what he says is what you need to do is take that habit and develop a follow-up habit that goes with it. And then another one and then another one. So maybe to your habit of coffee in the morning, maybe instead of having a habit of picking up your phone, because that can be a habit, and, and scrolling through the day, maybe your habit is, you know what? I'm going to take the word of God and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read it for the next 10, 15 minutes. Maybe it's you take that after my coffee, I'm going to go for a walk and I'm going to talk to God while I'm doing it. Or I'm just going to go for a walk. Or I'm just going to go talk to God. I don't know. It, your habits are going to be different because you're a different person. But sit there and go, okay, what are some things, what's a habit I need to develop now? Or what's a habit I have that I can use to stack on something else and stack on something else? And so here's what you do is you take these habits and you begin to stack one on top of the other. And so when you finish drinking your cup of coffee, it triggers you to go do read the word of God. When you read the word of God, it triggers you, oh, I got to go brush my teeth. Well, then when you're brushing your teeth, you know what? I've developed a habit. Now I'm going to do an, a minute of plank after that. And you start stacking habits throughout your day that build one another. And as you do that, it begins to provide momentum in the rest of your life. I think James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits, had probably read the Bible because this is what God's telling Joshua to do. I want you, Joshua, I want you to know me. I want you to make a habit, continue to follow in this habit of knowing me because when you do that, you're going to succeed. And here's the thing, Joshua had already began this habit, which is why for him, this was a continuation. You look in Exodus 33, 11, if you want to write that down on the side and go back and look at it. God had just finished talking to Moses. And it says, after this, inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And afterward, Moses would return to the camp. But the young man who assisted him, think about this, young man, this is 40 years before we get to the book of Joshua. Young man, Joshua, the son of Nun, would remain behind the tent of meeting. Why? Because he was developing a habit of knowing God. And so when it came, when push came to shove and he was having to lead people into that next spot, he already had that habit. 
when I look back and, and some of you guys know our story for the last nine years. Um, and, and if you don't, my wife, Kelly passed away a couple months ago and this has been a, a long battle with what we didn't realize at the time way back in 2015 when we started this, but all the way up through, it was a battle with cancer. It was a very difficult battle with cancer. We had a gift of, of eight extra years, honestly, from once we you know started treatment and, and, and it was a long battle. But when I look at what kept me in these nine years, it has been my disciplines and my habits. And I don't have a ton of them, but the ones I have have been the ones that have kept me. It has been, it has been the time in God's word that has been one of the greatest habits that I've developed in my life. And so I want to encourage you that, that if you don't have that habit in your life of taking time in your day, and maybe you've already got a habit of drinking coffee in the morning, add to that habit sitting down with the word of God. For me right now, I've actually shifted mine to nighttime. Why? Because it's when I get all the kids down and that is my habit. I sit down with my cup of, of tea and I'm, I'm reading God's word before I go to bed. That's a habit I'm developed. And why? Because it's your habits that bring courage. It's your commitments, the things you've committed to that develop and help you when you're facing these difficult situations that bring courage. Fourth thing of where courage comes from. It comes from our, it's a choice. It comes from our calling, comes from our commitments, but courage comes from God. Now, that may seem like it's, it's opposite of what uh, I just said, and that courage comes from our choices. It does, but courage also comes from God. And it makes it really easy to make the choice to have courage when you know who's on your side. Look at Joshua 1.9. Again, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He is reminding him. He's commanding him, but he's also reminding him, hey, bro, I'm with you. I'm with you. Our habits come from God or our, our, our courage comes from God. And Joshua was able to face this future with courage and lead a very difficult group of people. These guys were insane. You read through the Israelites and you're just like, you guys are idiots. Like truly are idiots. I don't understand. Like you read through these things and God even tells them, <laughs> I'm reading in Deuteronomy right now, my personal devotion. And God tells them, hey, look, it's not because you guys are actually great because you're not, you're terrible. I'm giving you this land. This is before Moses passes away. God's telling them, they're sitting there getting ready to go in before he's passed the torch to Joshua. And God tells the Israelites, hey, I'm not giving you this land because you're awesome. You guys suck. <laughs> it's like, he's just beating them down. You guys are really not great people. I'm giving you this to you because everybody else is really bad in there and it's time for them to go and because I made a promise to your ancestors. And so when Josh was taking over, God's going, hey man, look, I'm gonna be with you. I know these guys are a wreck, okay? I know they're a mess. I'm gonna be with you. I need you to be strong and courageous. When you look, we see this in other places in scripture. Um, David, King David, um, this is in 1 Samuel 30, but he and his men had gone on a battle. When they came back, someone had raided their villages and taken all of their children, their families and everything. And in verse six of 1 Samuel 30, it says, David was in great danger because all his men were very bitter. I'd imagine they just lost their wives, their children, everything. They were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters, and they began to talk of stoning him. That's not a good place to be. But then it says this, David found his strength in the Lord his God. When David was facing these tough moments, he turned to his God. He turned to the Lord. And there was an interesting thing I saw years ago when I was reading through 1 Samuel, was how many times the, the king Saul would say, the Lord your God, talking to the prophet Samuel. But to David, it was always the Lord my God. And so I want to ask this question for you today before I move on to, to wrapping this thing up. Is the Lord your God? Because if he's just your parents' God, if, if God is just something you're doing, if church is just something you're coming to, if you haven't made him your God where he is your source, your provider, your king, your protector, your savior, if you've not done that, then you're missing out big time on where the source of our courage comes from. It comes from our God. Psalms 56 this is David again. He says, but when I'm afraid, I will put my trust in you. I praise God for what he has promised and I trust in God. So why should I be afraid? What can your mortals do to me? Courage comes from God. So one last thing, when we look at courage, and I'm gonna try to blow through this pretty quick. We need courage because of this. Courage helps us enter our future and helps cut off our past. When the Israelites, after in, in Joshua 3, and if you want to read the story, you can flip over to Joshua 3 uh, and read through this. This I'm going to kind of highlight it and read through this passage of scripture. It's really cool. They get ready to go in 
And so they get up to the Jordan River, which was flooding at this time. It was completely, the Jordan River has a flood stage. And so when all the runoff comes from the mountains and everything, and so the Jordan River was in flood stage. If you've ever seen a river at flood stage, it is terrifying. And so he commands the priests to take the ark and they begin to walk into the Jordan River. That takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage, but they had to cross the Jordan River to cross into their future. And it's going to take courage for you to walk into what God has for you. And so these priests begin to, to step in. And I can't imagine what's going through their brain, but they're like, okay, Lord, we're going to trust you. So they pick up the ark and they begin to walk into the river. And as they do, the river begins to pile up upstream. In fact, God, like, like the crossing of the Red Sea, God stops the river and begins to pile up way back and it flows through. And so the Israelites are now looking at a dried riverbank. The only way that happened is they had to have the courage to step into that thing for you to enter the promised land, like what the things that God has for you, the good things that God has for you, for you to do that, you're going to have to have the courage to step out and trust him. Courage gives us the ability to face our future. So many things that that God has for you will require courage. God's just not going to like, oh, let's give you absolutely everything. It's going to require for you to step out in courage and trust him. But here's the thing. Even though the Israelites, they, 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 they crossed the Jordan River, they were in the promised land. They were there, but they couldn't actually occupy it till they dealt with their past and the parts of their life that weren't submitted to God. They they crossed the Jordan River. They came to this place called Gilgal. And it says that when they were there, that they circumcised all the all the children who had been born on the way who had not been circumcised before. Now I don't know why they weren't circumcised. I've 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 asked a couple rabbi friends and and I, I don't know why they weren't circumcised. There's some different tradition. I don't know. The Bible doesn't spell out, but circumcision was something that God had given to the Israelites as a sign of the covenant that he had between them and him. And so for years, 40 years, these these, these boys had been born and had not been circumcised. And so here they are crossing in the promised land and God's saying, hey, hey, wait, hold up. You've got to deal with your past. You've got to deal with the past 40 years. You have to cut off the shame of Egypt. You have to cut off the shame of these 40 years of you walking through the desert of, of the way you have 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 not served me, the way you've been selfish, the way you've not trusted, the way you've doubted, the way you've sinned. God comes to them and says, it's time to cut off your cast and leave it behind. And so they do that. They go through this, this period of circumcision. They spend days in their healing. But here's the thing. When it comes to God giving us the courage to face our future and face our past, he gets personal every single time. God loves you so much that he is going to cut on you in tender places. In the places that you've you've covered over and protected and, and hidden, the things you've been like, no, I'm not going to deal with this. That hurts too much. God's going to cut there. Why? Because he loves you and he needs you to have the courage to face your past so that you could step into your future. And I don't know what places you've got as we wrap this up today that are still uncircumcised in your life. I would imagine all of us have some places still. Maybe it's pride. Maybe it's your will. My way. That was my big thing for the longest time. I was like, God, I'm going to do things my way, not your way. Political ideas. Woo! we live in a very interesting time. You know what? Being honest, and this comes from a boy who grew up in a very political environment and I've been around a lot of politics. We oftentimes place our political views above the kingdom of God. So maybe there's some political stuff I need to cut away. Some things, am I, is that, am I placing the kingdoms of this world above the kingdoms of this God? Or am I recognizing that God is still king overall? How about busyness? That can be one when you get cut away. Fear, doubt, anger, the love of money, position, your identity as a husband, as a father, as a provider, as a lawyer, as a whatever it is. It could be your identity. Spiritual pride, traditions, abandonment, past hurts, past choices, sexual sins. These are all things that we have oftentimes that can be uncircumcised, places that we have not submitted to God. God wants to come and cut those things off. Hebrews 12.1 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge cloud of witnesses, the life of faith. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, who's the author and perfecter of our faith. And so as we wrap up today, I want to just, I want to do three things. I want to pray for you. If you you are here and you're going, man, pastor, I need courage today. I'm going to pray for you. You may be looking at situations, your role, things you need to cut off that you need courage. Maybe you're in this place, you need healing from sin. You need healing from past hurts. I'm going to pray for you. And maybe you have not connected with our King. Maybe you have not connected with the Lord. 
Maybe you have not made him your God. Maybe he's been somebody else's God. Maybe he's been something you've just been coming and doing and checking out. I want to challenge you today to make the Lord your God. So let me pray for you. God, I just thank you so much, Lord, for your word. I thank you for the way that you spoke to Joshua and you challenged him and you commanded him to be strong and courageous, to trust you, to follow you, and God, to, to, to face the things that you called him to do with courage, knowing that you were with him. And Lord, I just pray for, for everyone on here, Lord, for those that are there today facing their roles or situations, their choices, and going, God, I need some courage. Lord, I pray that, that they would choose today to be filled with courage, that they would choose to be courageous, they would choose to step out and be strong and to face those things, knowing that, God, you were with them. God, that you would fill them with your spirit and with your life. Lord, for those that are looking at places in their heart and their life that are not circumcised, the things that they have kept back, Lord, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's their pride, maybe it's the fear of, of not trusting you and letting go of something. God, maybe it's it's the way that we have to work so hard to provide and, 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 and we look to ourselves as our source and not you. God, I don't know what it is, but Lord, for every single person that looks at a place in their life that is uncircumcised, God, I pray you give them the courage, Lord, to turn that over to you, to, to repent, and God, to ask for you to cleanse them, to heal them, and to bring life in a place that there's been death. And for those of you that are today choosing to follow the Lord, I just want you just to pray with me. Just say, dear Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me when I've been such a big mess. And Lord, today I choose to make you my God. Jesus, I know that I'm, I'm a sinner and that you paid the price for my sin that you so I could be right with the Lord. So God, I choose today to follow you, to say that you are Lord, that you are Savior. And I choose to follow you with my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you guys so much for being with us today. Look forward to seeing you either at COTK for one of our services here in Lake Charles or in Kinder um, or back here online next week. Have a great one and we will see you guys later. God bless.